Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to St. Mary's Perivale for a rather special afternoon today. Instead of a straightforward piano recital, we have a lecture recital from Murray McLachlan, who won't need much introduction to pianophiles and people interested in the piano in general, because he's been running the keyboard department at Cheatham's uh, since 1997 and also teaches at the Royal Northern and uh, is an eminent figure in the piano world. I've been reading all his articles on technique and international piano for years, it seems, and uh, he's got a lot to tell us about uh, young pianists and careers and so many of these wonderful players who come and play here. And I thought it would be much more interesting to have a lecture than a straightforward recital. And I think we're in for a treat. Very grateful to Murray for having come down from Manchester. And I'll get off the stage and give a warm welcome to Murray. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you so much, Hugh. I'm delighted to be here. I think, Hugh, uh, you're incredible with what you do for music. And, um, I mean, along with another remarkable man in Newcastle called Ernie Scott, I think between the two of you, you are the saviours of young musicians. I think Ernie puts on 70 concerts, and you've literally given so many opportunities to hundreds and hundreds of fantastic pianists. So, I mean, if we had maybe another three Hugh Mathers in the world, then, then the whole of music would be incredibly peaceful and have lots of employment. But what you do is fabulous. Um, I have to say, I'm the, I'm on, I'm the third member of the family to come to do something for Hugh and the fourth member Matthew is coming next month so we're very grateful as a family. Callum and Rose thoroughly enjoyed playing for you as had indeed have lots of pupils over the years. Um, I think it's wonderful we're in a boom time for young musicians there's so many fabulous talents out there and I think this is cause for celebration you know when you have so many brilliant stars shining brightly we should all celebrate um, and I, I mean, over the years, at Cheatham's mainly, but also at the Royal Northern College of Music, seeing all these remarkable talents come and develop has been a great joy and a great inspiration. The joy of helping others is so, so wonderful and so important in life. Um, but I think the title of this talk, Character is Destiny, came about entirely because of lockdown. I have to apologise for looking like a, a 1970s rock and roller. I feel like one of the monkeys of all this hair, but we can't, we can't do anything about hairdressing at the moment. And it has been an extraordinary period. Um, and like many people, I started doing other things in lockdown that I haven't done before. I, w I won't go into weightlifting or trying to run 10 kilometres, which have only been partially successful or the least successful trying to learn German, but the, perhaps the most successful non-piano thing has been getting into an author who I had never heard of at all called Douglas Kennedy, um, who has written 14 novels. And coming down on the train today, I'm reading the 14th one, which is The Great Wide Open. And that has been a tremendous source of um, of inspiration to me since March and lockdown, as you can guess, reading 14 very, very exciting books. I mean, when you are teaching online and on screen, um, there's a limit to what you can do after six hours of staring at your computer. Um, and I, I'm not really up to reading James Joyce's Ulysses or going through the complete works of Shakespeare, but Douglas Kennedy fits the bill. It's incredibly easy prose to read. I would suggest very eloquent, a kind of modern Somerset Mon in that sense. And yet, as an author, though being very readable, incredible insights and illuminations. I mean, it's not every best-selling author that has scenes which involve Angela Hewitt playing the Goldberg Variations, or which go into depth at the end of a novel about Heisenberg and his theory. Um, so wonderfully deep, but wonderfully readable books, perhaps a kind of modern Graham Greene, although without the Catholic um, in, uh, implications, that the religion that comes into Graham Greene. Indeed, one of um, Douglas Kennedy's travel books 
in God's country um, is an extraordinary tour of all the kind of evangelical uh, uh, churches and the people that he meets and the infamous Bob Jones University, which is, anyway, I diverse. The main reason for this talk is because all the way through Kennedy's writings and Facebook, it, in his blog, indeed, even in um, some of his novels and The Pursuit of Happiness, he talks about character is destiny. Um, it's not uh, an original um, concept. He got it from a philosopher in Germany, but Goethe talked about character being destiny. It actually goes back to the Greek philosopher Her Heraclitus, um, and it implies that destiny or fate is not predetermined by an outside force, but by one's inner character. And I think it's so important for young pianists to remember that, that character uh, is the resilient force that will determine how everything in life happens and, and turns out ultimately. Character is what drives us. Um, very interesting that the unsuccessful a Democrat contender for the presidential election, uh, the Senator J John McCain, also has a collection of stories called Character is Destiny, uh, in which he looks at people who uh, have embodied principles of ethical and moral behavior. And um, really quite interesting. But let's get to the, the root of it all. When we're dealing with character, when we're dealing with um, uh, a sense of inner belief in what we're doing. Uh, we have more strength than if we have negativity and doubt. I think one of the most difficult things, the mo one of the biggest tests of character, is the ability to organize practice and to remain resilient day after day after day. And, and I've come to the conclusion that one of the great pitfalls is impatience. Um, Leschetizky, wonderful, perhaps the greatest teacher of all time, would famously spend a whole hour of a lesson on one bar of music. And Stephen Kovacevic mentions that Dame Myra Hess once spent a whole lesson on the theme only of the Brahms um, Handel variations. But having that kind of um, concentrated focus that you can stay on a little bit of music and absolutely get everything out of it is a tremendous attribute and something that is not necessarily um, common in young musicians who are often very, very, very understandably keen to get through lots and lots of notes and to move forward as quickly as possible. But organization, efficiency, order, control, scheduling, all these things are very, very rare to find naturally in young musicians who tend to be much more dreamy and, and nature and who will um, get into the syndrome of last-minute-itis if they're not too careful. Um, last-minute-itis is unbelievably harmful in the long term because the adrenaline and the exhilaration that comes from learning something at the 11th hour will inevitably, after the 11th hour has passed, lead to a sense of exhaustion and then prolong the next uh, task, meaning that it also has to be done at the last minute, and then you'll end up being exhilarated and then have a drop again. And before you know where you are, it's like your blood sugar level going up and down. And eventually, if you're not careful, that can lead to burnout. That's terrible. Not to say, however, that um, last minute-itis isn't often the source of genius. And um, I'm going to come now to Cacciaturian and the Toccata, which is our first piece. Cacciaturian's Toccata is the ultimate genius piece of last minute-itis. Um, legend has it that he started writing it at midnight, finished at dawn, handed it to a pianist at the Mosul Conservatoire who practiced it in the morning and gave the world premiere in the afternoon. So um, here's a celebration of last minute-itis, Cacciaturian's Toccata.
really need a haircut. <laughs> anyway, I mean, Charlie Chaplin said about Paderewski, some people call it pianism, I call it hair. So I'm feeling I'm in the 1920s. <laughs> so on we go. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one thing that needs to be sorted out and character will determine that. Some people never learn to be organized. Another thing that um, young musicians and young pianists fight with is melancholia and sadness and depression. Um, and um, it's so, so, so important to be as positive as possible. I mean, the cliche of looking in the mirror and smiling and saying I'm wonderful every day actually is really important. And, you know, to make an absolute effort, you know, not to look on the bad, not to look on the negative of everything, you know, um, to be really um, absolutely vibrantly energized and looking on the, the bright side. The glass is not half empty, it's half full. Um, I think that is so, so important that we can all talk about um, the law of attraction and smile a little bit at the naivety perhaps, but I think it's absolutely true that if you go out um, in the morning, if you get out of bed and you stand on a drawing pin and feel furious, then you'll um, be so angry you'll shake your head and hit it on the bed and then you'll go in and cut yourself shaving and then you'll come down and be so annoyed you'll forget about the toast which will burn and you'll storm out of the house and go through a red light and get a, a parking ticket and go into the office or the school and shout at people and make enemies. It's a kind of vicious circle. Whereas if you get out of bed in the morning and you giggle when you've had a, a pin uh, um, prick your foot, uh, then you will not bang your head, you'll go downstairs, have wonderful toast, and so it continues. It's the same with piano playing, it's the same with playing Mazeppa. If you start off and get annoyed about a wrong note that you play in the first um, horse's gallop, then the second one will go even worse, and by the third one you'll be sweating of all these leaps and aki akaturas and, and hating the piano and hating the whole thing of it. Uh, you know, I mean, we've got to not take ourselves too seriously when minutia uh, uh, is not quite what we want. Um, and having the ability um, to have... A, energized positivity will reflect on other people. If you rejoice and have gratitude and have a sense of real um, warmth and real enthusiasm for the, the pleasures that you've got, and my goodness me, as musicians, we've got so many pleasures. Um, if we can just remember the jewels, the wonderful masterpieces that we are involved with, then we have every reason to smile and be very happy, even if we stand on the proverbial drawing pin when we get out of bed in the morning. Um, melancholia can be a very positive force. The worst year of my life was 2015. And in the course of a couple of weeks, in March, um, I lost not only my father, but I lost um, Peter Caton, who was one of the main teachers I had, amazing teacher, amazing pianist, great musician, and to crown it all, I lost my musical father, Ronald Stevenson. Um, they all, in fact, Ronald died on the day of my dad's funeral. Horrible time. I did realize on Valentine's Day uh, 2015, um, when Marjorie, Ronald's wonderful wife and now widow, uh, took asked me to come up to see him in hospital in Peebles. I did realize that this would probably be the last time I would see him alive. And I took the train to Edinburgh, but I thought, um, I must do something. And I remembered that in 1975, some 40 years earlier, just before the death of Shostakovich, Ronald was coming down on the same train line that I was coming up. He was coming down from Edinburgh via Preston to Manchester. I was going up from from Manchester via Preston to Edinburgh, Ronald sat down and wrote an incredible recitative and air on four notes, DSCH, the initials of Shostakovich, which is a tremendously poignant piece. And I thought, I've got to do something positive here. I'm feeling so unhappy. And I thought, well, if he did this piece before Preston, I shall take Ronald's jewel of a song, A Gowden Lyric, to words by the great Scottish poet Hugh McDermott, and I'll set it for piano and put it down a semitone into D flat major and lay it out in three staves, use all three pedals. And let's see if I can um, write this before Preston, which I just did with a few seconds to spare, uh, and play it to him in hospital. 
all praise to the National Health Service in rural Scotland, because my goodness me, when I went into this hospital with John McLeod, the composer who kindly drove me down from Edinburgh to Peebles, wonderful composer John McLeod too, um, we went into this hospital, there's this gorgeous upright piano, which was perfectly in tune, and I was able to play in an NHS hospital, a recital for about half an hour to Ronald of the bits of the Passacaglia, and to play this very, very poignant, um, wonderful melody. I, I think Martin Anderson once said, if Ronald's masterpiece is not the Passacaglia, which is 85 minutes long, it is his A Gowden lyric, which is only about a minute long. Uh, but my goodness me, what a minute it is. So here we have um, something written in the profound depths of despair by me, which um, had a, a, a realm of positivity about it at my darkest hour, if you like. I think music has the power to heal, music has the power to energize, um, and I think music has the power to take oneself away from the ego, um, and ultimately when we get into peak experience, we are e experiencing something that seems to make time stand still. Um, um, it always makes me laugh uh, and giggle when I happen to stumble across reality um, talent shows on, on television and people go on about, I wanted to express my emotions and they use uh, the personal pronoun, 
known a lot and use I and my. I personally make a very, very big stance when writing to avoid using personal pronouns as much as possible. People aren't particularly interested in me. I'm not interested in me. I'm interested in getting beyond myself. I want to get into the energetic field, the energized field of music. And the greatest moments, Alfred Brendel once said, I believe, that he loved the piece that came after the interval often the most. And I remember Peter Caton said that as well. That, um, or he said in the encore, uh, when he was absolutely relaxed, he often felt at his best. When you forget all about um, people listening to you, forget about yourself, the piano, the pianist, the audience, the music, the acoustic, everything becomes as one. Then you will never be melancholic. Then you will never be negative. You, then you will never feel awkward. That's when you become at one with the spirit of music. That's what we should all be aiming for, surely. Um, I do think that in the 21st century, um, it's much easier, um, having said that, to be diverse and to be different and to not worry about conforming about what other people do or other people expect. Um, Douglas Kennedy is wonderful on critics. Um, recently, I think he quoted Jean Sibelius, the great Finnish symphonist, who said there's never been a statue erected to the memory of a critic. Um, and we have to kind of not worry about what other people are thinking. Uh, we have to do our own thing. And that's often very, very difficult for a teenager in particular who may be wanting to uh, fit in with everyone else. And yet, you know, the strength of character, uh, the success will come not when you do exactly what everybody else does, but when you, with integrity, uh, find your own particular pathway. Now, I must get out a couple of books. Um, yeah, these are the famous uh, Echier editions of Chopin. Very, very wonderful and painstakingly done and finished in time for the Chopin centenary, bicentenary year in 2010. Um, but they're, they're very strong additions. You know, we have fingering very specifically put down. We have pedaling extremely adamantly put down there. Now, it would be very, very easy for um, an insecure young musician, or indeed an insecure teacher, and um, to feel, gosh, this is the great Echier edition. That means I've got to put down my thumb there and change silently to five on bar 133 of the G minor nocturne, or else I won't be up to scratch. But there's something slightly brave new worldish, Aldous Huxley-like, about um, people all over the, the globe, from New Zealand, via Singapore, China, Japan, Africa, Europe, Alaska, no doubt, Iceland, America, South America, all buying this book and all in bar 133 putting their thumb down and changing to five. That slightly freaks me out and slightly makes me unhappy um, because the spirit of Chopin is a free spirit. We do know for a fact that he changed his mind very often. And... Um, I'll put that back down there. Yeah, I mean, the fantasy impromptu in two versions, the, one of the, a, the waltz, the A-flat waltz in three versions, and the, the, the annotated ornamentation for one of his pupils of the first nocturne. It's interesting, but the spirit of the music has an element of improvisatory, um, spur-of-the-moment creativity about it. And to feel that every single time you do a certain thing that you put your fingering down and that's it to the end of time is slightly... Um, uninspiring for me, and I, I'm convinced with Chopin it's wrong. Um, like many musicians, um, I have um, been rather upset about the Henley edition of Chopin. I even got into trouble um, for doing a not um, exactly over-the-top positive review of their edition of the ballad. I think they were very cross with me, but simply because even for the research in the edition is wonderful, this adamant kind of dogmatic laying down the rules, which seemed to go, in my opinion at the time, against a spirit of sensitive listening and the spirit of 
being able to adjust the music according to circumstance and needs uh, seemed to be not there in that particular edition. I love Henley editions in many senses, um, even if they're not our text editions, because they have incredible fingering. And look out, by the way, for this amazing new Haydn four-volume spectacular edition with um, so many great pianists, each taking a sonata and putting their own fingerings in there. An amazing testament. Um, but, I mean, I remember as, as a childhood experience, um, uh, uh, in Aberdeen, the, the, the music advisor, Donald Hawksworth, who was a, a wonderful influence in my life and a great character, used to climb up um, the Atlas Mountains and things and go off on these hikes all over the place. But he um, went away and his whole house with every single be belonging that he had was blown up. It was in the front local paper. It looked like something out of a uh, out of Armageddon, just a pile of bricks. So he lost every item of clothing, every item of furniture, his bed, everything went. And he came back and said, oh, I don't care about that. So the only thing I care about is the fingering in my Bach organ works, uh, because I've, I, I, I really need to have the fingering. Um, and <laughs> I thought that was admirable in many ways. But on the other hand, um, I would say not so admirable, because fingering and the ability to adjust it um, is an ongoing creative process and ultimately we should feel that we're never fixated with any one way of doing something that we're always um, open to new suggestions that's what keeps us young you will always be a young musician if you are exploring new possibilities accepting the new and trying out different things now i'm now going to play some ronald stevenson written shortly after he was released from prison for being a pacifist and not doing his national service in 1949 to celebrate the anniversary of chopin's centenary the death a uh, hundred years earlier and um, now this would be unbelievably frowned upon in certain circles in the 20th century uh, because it's taking the fourth ballad and going off at a totally different tangent um, but Chopin's fourth ballad will remain there as a wonderful icon for discovery. And we're not destroying Chopin by commenting on Chopin. Godofsky, with his incredible um, etudes after the Chopin studies themselves, is testament to that with all the different harmonies and colours and counterpoints that he brings to this basic icon of music. So in a sense, this is in the tradition of Godofsky, this fugue which is written, and it quotes in the middle the fourth ballad. Um, as, and it's the counterpoint from that quotation which led to the whole piece being constructed, a little bit like a kind of uh, alternative soundtrack uh, for um, the scene in Walt Disney's Fantasia in which the sorcerer's apprentice gets things out of hand if I can put it that way, with the fugue entry of the fourth ballad um, sounding very intense and getting very excited before the middle. So, Ronald Stevenson, Fugue on a Fragment of Chopin, 1949.
that's one of uh, a number of commentaries on Chopin uh, um, that Ronald wrote, including Pensée sur le prélude de Chopin, uh, a whole series of works uh, that uh, certainly show a lack of fear of being different. I think it's very, very sad that um, you remember the 1972 proms when Ronald played his second piano concerto, which has quotations from uh, the blues, from jazz music in it, and a viola player um, objected to having that kind of music in a classical situation, which is horrific. We can't begin to imagine that nowadays. So we have improved considerably. Our um, appreciation um, and our open-mindedness certainly has increased in the 21st century, and that's cause for celebration. Um, so as well as being different, it's very important not to be different just for the sake of it. Now, personally, um, when I read Pierre Boulez's writings on music, um, I, I tend to get rather disconcerted. Uh, whether or not Boulez was being tongue-in-cheek or entirely serious is another matter because he was a great composer, great conductor, unquestionably. But when there were these writings which seem to imply that you have to have a complete break of the past and have something totally new and, and different, that seems to be, in a sense, um, shooting yourself in the foot spectacularly. Of course, it's impossible in music to really create a motif which is entirely new and hasn't been done before. I mean, you can go play a wonderful game of finding the same motif in medieval music and Baroque and classical, romantic and modern pieces. Um, uh, what does that tell us? Well, there are certain, um, certain emotions, certain figures, certain progressions which will always be there. Uh, and we should celebrate that. We should grow from the past. Um, I think the end of Ferruccio Bozzoni's opera, Dr. Faust, the epilogue, uh, when he says to take things from the opera, the new generation, and uh, from the seeds will, will, will uh, develop and new, new things will evolve from his opera, is a wonderful, wonderful, noble um, idea. And also, perhaps, the real reason that we should all be teachers uh, to give to the next generation, just as the previous generation has given to us. Um, Norma Fisher um, gave a wonderful um, talk here uh, at the last session, last lecture, and I was very privileged to study with her for a number of years. And um, I feel, in a sense, it's a little bit like passing a baton on. Um, and um, uh, I think, of course, Norma will keep on teaching for decades to come. But I think that the sense of teaching in general um, is an idea of taking from the past and giving to the future and always looking to the future. I mean, another Ronald Stevenson quotation that comes to mind, something along the lines of, you see God through the eyes of your children and giving to children, giving to the new generation is perhaps the most wonderful thing in music. And it's connected so much with playing and with composition. Um, I think that they are, in a sense, composing and playing and teaching are three sides of the same wonderful um, uh, building, uh, uh, looking at it from different perspectives, but uh, very much interrelated. We should never forget that Franz Liszt said that the three things a pianist needs are the ability to have technique, the ability to improvise, and the ability to compose. Perhaps in the post World, Second World War era of our text editions and competitions. Perhaps the musical establishments around the world lost that wonderful sentiment and we became too specialized and too anti-transcription. Um, uh, I think that George Bollett was a key figure in bringing the art of transcription, as was indeed Shura Cherkasky uh, in the late 20th century, um, back into fashion. And I like to think that people are much more willing to explore new repertoire and possibilities. But this, the next part, I want to say, sing, dance, and connect, and celebrate with your roots. Make them part of your soul. We all have music in our hearts, and we would be very, very foolhardy to dismiss our parents and our grandparents, our musical ancestors, our musical predecessors. And, um, and it's not just, it's totally different from just doing what your mummy or daddy tell you or what your musical mummy and daddy tell you to do. It's very much um, to do with um, going with your guts and embracing your past culture. Now, the best way I can think as a Scottish pianist and teacher and writer of embracing my own roots, and a good example is this next piece I'm going to play. 
Now, Robert Burns was one of the greatest um, poet songwriters of all time. People forget about his, his melodies away from Scotland. Uh, but in the 18th century, he wrote this wonderful song called I Walk and O. Uh, it's, it's nothing to do with walking, it's about staying awake, a love song. Um, a young lady is lying sleepless in her bed with insomnia because of love. A uh, beautiful, charming song. Now, Francis George Scott, who died in 1958, uh, a wonderful songwriter. By the way, that's a, a subject for another talk. The unbelievably appalling neglect of F.G. Scott. A uh, wonderful composer. One of the great song composers of the 20th century. Totally neglected. Totally out of fashion. Well, he decided that he wanted to write another melody to go with Burns' wonderful words. And, of course, got the Scottish establishment against him because of that. How dare he dabble with Burns? How dare he thinks he's better? It's not a case of being better. It's a case of, of, of being inspired by the melody. Anyway, so we have the F.G. Scott song, but then Ronald Stevenson in the 1960s, after he'd written his Pasacalia, decided to make a transcription of the F.G. Scott song. Uh, so now, as a younger generation from Ronald, I'm going to play Ronald's arrangement, which is inspired by F.G. Scott, which is inspired by Robert Burns. So here we are, I walk in all, um, uh, F.G. Scott Stevenson, to words by Robert Burns.
Thank you very much. Um, so moving on, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about <laughs> testosterone, music and sport and competitions. Um, what I think is really um, important, and this ties up to melancholia uh, with young musicians, separating the art and the vocation of music from the business. This is absolutely crucial. Uh, really, really important. I think so much unhappiness comes when musicians are unable to separate uh, the, the Russian roulette or the, the, or the, the unpredictability of um, the music business and their um, book ability to separate that from their ongoing, um, steadfast, exciting, inspiring, inspiring love of music. The two things are totally different. If you see music business, music industry, how I hate it when people talk about the music industry. Um, it's much more than that. It's something sacred, it's something very special. But if you can't separate your special um, journey as a musician from the industry and the success, then you are always going to be unhappy, no matter how successful you are, I would suggest. Um, I never forget our uh, former esteemed Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, visited Oxford University and asked an undergraduate what um, he was studying. When he said history, she said, what a luxury. Um, now, to me, that comment from her um, goes against the whole ethos of what universities are about. They were formed in the medieval times not to provide an industry, an industrial career for people. They're formed to educate and to enlighten and to enrich and to inspire. The whole educational um, thing is about that. And equipping you afterwards for industry is so much easier. There are statistics out there which prove that music undergraduates, when they become graduates, become much more adaptable and much better organized, much better at multitasking, much more creative to find job opportunities than, than graduates who do other subjects. So, I mean, I'm not worried about the thousands and thousands of wonderful graduates that emerge from the music college. I'm actually wanting more and more of them because they will give so much to society. They don't necessarily have to all become like Lang Lang and play at Carnegie Hall, but good luck to them if they do. Um, they can become successful in all kinds of walks of life. When you're 21, you've got the whole world ahead of you, or 22. It's not the end of the road at the end of an undergraduate career. And for parents to worry, as they will unquestionably worry, about whether doing music is the right thing or not. Um, I think this is really, really important news, that studying music intensely and with uh, passion and doing something you love is so valuable and will lead to a much happier life. At the Cheatham Summer School, it's a great privilege to see adult amateur pianists um, and to and, and, and to celebrate with them as they have a wonderful time and spend a week or even two weeks at Cheatham's enjoying what they love doing the most. But there's a, there's a kind of sadness there as well because so many of them have come up to myself and to Catherine who organises it all um, and said, you know, I'm, I, I so, I've been so unhappy because I made the decision to not do music and I've been doing law, or I've been doing administration, or I've been doing um, medicine or whatever. Um, and, and it seems very sad that they've only come back to music maybe decades after they gave up. And yet it was always there for them. And it didn't necessarily mean that by doing medicine that they would have to stop playing at, at 20. Or conversely, it didn't mean that they had to do medicine in order to have a safe job. My goodness me, we're living in a world which is so unsafe and unpredictable now that it seems more sensible to do what you love and enjoy doing what you love rather than not doing what, what you love and having a miserable time of it. Um, um, it's interesting, I mean, Douglas Kennedy um, does an amazing journal and on Facebook some very, very wonderful comments that are of direct relevance to pianists. Um, uh, I have known, this is Kennedy speaking, I have known people who have made major life-changing decisions in the face of the knowledge that the result is going to be something that they will not like living with, but do so to f save face or balm their injured pride. Now that's very relevant to what I'm talking about. I have known people who have slammed doors 
on others refusing to negotiate a situation and taking partial responsibility for what has occurred because that would mean stepping back from their position. Uh, so getting away from a kind of fear or a stubbornness and feeling that they have to um, stand uh, because uh, they don't want to lose face and the fear of what other people may think is absolutely vital. Um, and, um, you know, that's character again. Um, when it comes to competitions, the, the success, the long-term success of them for the pupil, for the pianist, will depend on how successfully they can separate the worldly uh, throw of the dice from their ongoing, wonderful, nurtured, caring love of music, which they will use to get in the zone. And if they can separate, if the teachers, if the parents can separate um, the two, there is no reason not to enter competitions. Sometimes you'll enter them and you'll be told that you're not getting past the first round. Other times you'll enter them and you'll win first prize. It, there, there's something very unpredictable about it all. And who cares? Ultimately, you know, the determination of how successful or how unsuccessful it will be will depend on your attitude. I mean, I'm standing here, this roof could fall down on top of me now, um, and, and I could you know, either just lie there and die gradually, or I could phone and I could ask Hugh to come and save me. Um, if I ask Hugh to come and save me, there might be a positivity that might come of it, and I might learn something from the experience, and there'd be a lifelong bond of friendship. Of course, we're already friends, Hugh and I, but we would become even closer friends because he would have saved my life. Or I could lie there and die. And it's the same with competitions. If you get knocked out in one, you can mope and be miserable, or you can learn from the positivity of it all and say, okay, well... I was happy with the way I played. I felt I was in the zone. Um, and listen back to your recording. If you're not happy with it, you'll learn a lot about it. Uh, it's the same thing. We can certainly learn a lot from sportsmen. I think in many ways, um, in music is behind sport, you know, certainly in terms of sports medicine, sports psychology, visualization. But ultimately, we're not in the game as artists of being competitive of each other. One of the first things Peter Caton said to me um, was, art is not competitive, which was very, very, I didn't believe him at the time as a 20 year old, uh, but I do not see where he's getting from. Ultimately, being able to separate the um, journey that you're on, and it is a journey, um, and it's a journey without end, but being able to separate that from the business is the key to long-term happiness and success. Now, as a kind of homage to the competition circuit, and in a, at a time of year when people who teach at conservatoires are dealing with, piano at conservatoires are dealing with etudes, uh, I shall play one of the Chopin studies, the opus 25, number 10, um, which is so much more than a uh, competition war horse. Um, with amazing colours, it's a tone poem par excellence that transcends the competition gladiatorial circus uh, very much and is, is a wonderful piece of music in its own right. But here we go. Chopin's Etude, Opus 25, number 10.
I'd like to close um, by um, really summarizing what this talk's all been about um, and thinking about a few other things um, in the process. Um, I think it's very, very much a talk um, about positivity. I think it's very much about connecting with music as a force, as a lifetime's journey. If one feels that one never wants to arrive, um, one will have a tremendously fulfilled time. It's not about the destination. It's not about the consumerism. It's about the joy of discovering and rediscovering and rediscovering again. Um, so many excellent pianists, so many excellent teachers, so many wonderful musicians. Um, what determines their long-term development? Character, I would suggest. Um, don't just follow the crowd. Embrace your own instincts, passions, motivations, but ultimately lose them in the energetic force of music itself. I think it would be wonderful if I could um, just read out a little bit of Douglas Kennedy to close. Um, it's been such a big part of my evenings after practicing, teaching, writing, um, to turn to this wonderfully inspiring and yet readable author. Very elegant. This is the end of the moment, which um, I have to say, there's not many authors reduce me to tears, but I was in floods of tears at the end of the moment. Um, and um, I was in floods of tears at the end of Isabel in the afternoon. Uh, this is from, sorry, Leaving the World, which made me very dreamy for about an hour after I'd read it. Uh, but I think he's using scenery as a metaphor for life. We can use it as a metaphor for the world of music. Um, and so here we go. So I'll read this bit out. But Verne, reading my thoughts, touched my arm again and said, look up, Jane, look up. I took a deep, steadying breath. breath. I felt a shudder come over me. I held it in check. After a moment, I finally did look up. And what I saw in front of me was a lake, absolutely still, serene, and yes, emerald. The lake stretched towards a definable horizon, a vast meadow that in turn ran right into a wall of mountains. It was a peerless day in the west, a hard blue sky, empty of clouds, a sun that, though initially harsh to the eye, bathed everything in a honeyed glow. Its glare forced me to lower my head, but then I raised it up again. The lake was one of topology's most fortuitous accidents. It occupied centre stage in an amphitheatre of glacial peaks, many still dense with snow. It was a scenic vista of such scope, such complete purity, that I blinked and felt tears. I had been able to look at the lake. It meant everything. It meant nothing, but I had looked up. I had seen the lake, and that was something, I suppose. Thank you, I said to Vern, my voice a whisper. He did something unexpected. He took my hand. We said nothing for several minutes. I turned my gaze from the lake to the sky, and somewhere in the messy filing cabinet that is my brain came a remembrance of a particular sleepless night some months past. Up with grief and the sense that I was now living in a fathomless world, surfing the net, trying to murder the hours until first light, and suddenly deciding to Google the word uncertainty. And what did I find? Well, amongst other things, there were several pages on a German mathematical physicist called Werner Heisenberg, the father of the uncertainty principle, who posited the idea that in physics, there is no way of knowing where a moving particle is given its detail and thereby, by extension, we can never predict where it will go. That's destiny, I told myself after reading this, a random dispatch of particles which brings you to places you never imagined finding yourself. After all, uncertainty governs every moment of human existence. But staring now at that deep blue western sky and seeing it reflected in the lake, a second quote came back to me from that web page. It was the notion put forward by another physicist that space was a field of linear operations. Heisenberg, ever the pragmatist, would have nothing of it. And what was his famous retort? Suddenly I heard myself saying out loud, space is blue and birds fly through it. 
space is blue and birds fly through it. Let's rephrase that for all pianists. Music is golden and pianists shine through its loving power and inspiring radiant glow. Thank you all very, very much. Well, I don't know quite how to summarize that inspiring talk. I think it should be compulsory viewing for all young pianists to give them a balanced view on their future and their vocation. And there are so many golden nuggets to take away. I think I'm going to watch it again when I get home to drink up all those important messages uh, from someone with such wisdom and such long experience in dealing with people who are inspired by music but sometimes negative and sometimes dragged down by the business side of the whole thing which we all know can be pretty awful but I found it quite inspiring and well the talk will remain up for at least a month and I hope all young pianists uh, watch it and learn valuable lessons about life and there's more to life than the next competition ah anyway uh, if you've enjoyed it too, um, it'd be very nice if you could go to our donations page and please donate via our PayPal facility uh, to keep all these concerts going. We have at least 120 concerts this year. We put on almost 100 concerts in the lockdown. Uh, the next concert's on Tuesday afternoon, a piano recital by Riyad Nicholas. And so it goes on. Uh, lots more concerts, lots more wonderful pianists coming here, including two more McLachlans later in the season. And both are playing in our Beethoven Festival uh, in October when we have 32 pianists playing all the sonatas. Ah, so, so it goes on. Thank you very much for being with us on a very special afternoon. And... Uh, if I were you, I'd watch the whole thing again and l absorb some of those important messages. Thank you very much and good afternoon. <laughs>